Lord, we are coming to you again, and we thank you so much for the privilege we have to study together. We pray for the Holy Spirit to take possession of each one of us, to lead our hearts and minds, and uh, give us new insights of who you are, of what you are doing in our lives, and uh, how we can rely on you. We pray that uh, we will sense your presence with us here, right now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis 42, 43, and 44. An absolutely outstanding part of Joseph's story. Chapter 42 looks like this. You have that chiasm on your worksheet. And it starts with uh, Jacob sending his sons to Egypt to buy food, because there's a famine in Canaan. And then Jacob uh, receives his sons back. The nine sons return to Jacob with grain. So they go down to Egypt, they come back from Egypt, but there's something very interesting happening right here in the middle. They go to jail. All of them, all ten of them go to jail for three days. Then after three days, they are released, except for who? Simeon. Simeon, who is uh, how many yet in the row? You have Reuben, then, uh -huh, and then Levi, and then Judah. So, we don't know exactly why Joseph kept Simeon in prison. We just suspect that since Reuben wanted to save him, and in this section, we find out that Reuben actually pleaded with them when they wanted to kill Joseph, wanted to harm Joseph. Reuben pleaded with them, hey, let's not do harm to this little guy, younger guy, because they were not children at that time. They were not kids. They were grown-ups. But the second eldest is Simeon, and it can easily be that he is the moral author of Joseph being taken out of the pit and sold into slavery and then taken to Egypt. But what is interesting here is that they go down to Egypt, get into jail. Is anybody else that went or was taken down to Egypt and taken to jail? Joseph. So you can see how, in a way, his brothers redo his story. Well, just a little bit, because then they are released and they go home. It's interesting to see in chapter 42 where the focus of the entire conversation goes. They are put into jail, but they say, we are honest men. Then why are you in jail? Chapter 42 from verse 11. This is what it says. We are all one man's sons. We are honest men. Your servants are not spies. Because when Joseph recognizes them, that's the accusation. The way Joseph treats them can sound or can seem pretty weird. But just imagine, these ten brothers, his brothers, one day show up in front of him and bow down. And the text says... Joseph remembered what? The dreams. 
So now it seems that he wants to find out what kind of characters these people are. Are they the same kind of people? So he tests them. Pretty torturing. You are spies. And they say, no, we are all one man's son. We are honest men. Are you? But he said to them, no, but you have come to see the nakedness of the land. The nakedness of the land is a beautiful Hebraic way of saying you've come to spy out those uh, vulnerable corners of the land. Look around, see what's going on, where the nakedness of the land is, and then come back and hit. Verse 14, again, Joseph says to them, it is as I spoke to you, saying, you are spies. He plays strong. Yeah. Verse 18, then Joseph said to them the third day, this is when he gets them out of jail, do this and live, for I fear God. Oh, thank God he fears God. Because if not, what would have happened to the brothers? He was, in the end, the governor of Egypt, second in command. So he could have done whatever he wanted. But I fear God. If you are honest men, again, verse 19, let one of your brothers be confined to your prison house, but you go and carry grain to the famine of your houses. Verse 21. Then they say to one another, We are truly guilty concerning our brother, for we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us, and we would not hear. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. And Reuben says what he says. I told you guys. I told you. But isn't it interesting that they immediately knew what was happening? Let me ask you something. Don't you have experiences when something happens and you kind of know why it happened? I know modern psychology works hard on explaining all those causality realities away. But it seems that when something happens because of something, people may know. They knew exactly what was going on. We go on with the story. Joseph has a hard time handling his emotions. He weeps, according to verse 24. Then the brothers leave. When one of them opens the sack, he finds the money there. That's kind of scary. Then when they get home and each one of them finds the money in the mouth of the sack... Verse 28 says, then their hearts failed them and they were afraid. The Hebrew concept is their heart sank. I don't know if you have ever felt this kind of uh, um, psychosomatic thing going on in your body when your heart moves from here <laughs> all the way down. <laughs> That's how you feel. Of course, the heart doesn't move anywhere. But their heart sank. That's what it says. Their heart sank. They were afraid, saying to one another, what is this that who? God has done to us. So they even recognize it is God playing with them. 31, but we said to him, explaining to their father, we are honest men. We are not spies. Verse 34. 
and bring your youngest brother to me. This is what Joseph told them. And now the brothers tell Jacob what Joseph told them. So I shall know that you are not spies, but that you are honest men. So throughout this section, there's an accusation that they are spies, and there is this self-defense that they are what? Honest men. And maybe they are. Only that at one point in their life, they were not. At least at one point. Because remember how they sold Joseph. They not only sold him, they lied to their father and uh, made him believe that Joseph was torn apart by savage animals. So, they are back home, Simeon in prison, Jacob disturbed by the happenings, for sure. Time passes, hunger is hunger, they have to go back. And Jacob wants them to go back, but they tell him, hey, that guy was pretty categorical. We can't go back unless we take Benjamin. So Reuben steps up first, and he tries to convince Jacob to no avail. Then Judah comes in chapter 43, verse 3. But Judah spoke to him, saying, The man solemnly warned us, saying, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. So we have to take Benjamin. Verse 8, Then Judah said to Israel, his father, Send the lad with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I myself will be surety. What's that? A pledge. I myself will be surety for him. Reuben said something similar. He said, kill my two sons. And Jacob said, no, no, no. He's not going to go with you. Judah says, this Judah, this strange guy. You still remember the story with Tamar. But he says, I myself will be surety for him. From my hand you shall require him if I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. Verse 11, And their father Israel said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the best fruits of the land. Do something special for him, take some present for him. And they go, verse 14, listen to Jacob's prayer. And may God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may release your other brother and Benjamin. If... I am bereaved. I am bereaved. What does that tell you about Jacob? Whatever will happen, I'll have to take it as coming from God. When Joseph saw Benjamin, verse 16, he said to the steward of his house, Take these men to my home. So from where the distribution of food was happening, they were taken to Joseph's home. So they are taken from this place. I don't know what they did with the donkeys. Did they leave them there or they 
took the donkeys as well. But they are taken from here to Joseph's house. And there in Joseph's house, they go through a roller coaster of emotions. Verse 18, now the men were afraid because they were brought into Joseph's house and they said, it is because of the money which was returned in our sacks. Then the steward steps in and tells them, no, 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 don't be afraid, don't uh, overthink this. I like verse 23, but he said, peace be with you, do not be afraid, your God and the God of your father. The steward is speaking to them about their God and the God of their father. That must have sounded a little strange to them. How does this steward even know about the God of our Father? Has given you treasure in your sex. Simeon is brought back to them. And they will have a chance to eat with their brother right there in his house. Verse 30, now his heart yearned for his brother, for Benjamin. So Joseph made haste and sought somewhere to what? To weep again. So there are a few moments along the story when Joseph does the most human thing possible in a context like this. He withdraws and just weeps. And there will be a moment later on when he will weep along with his brothers. So with this, verse 33, and they set before him the firstborn according to his birthright and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked in astonishment at one another. So imagine this. All 11 of them there, and uh, the steward or whoever sits them at the table knows how to arrange them from the eldest to the youngest in the exact order. Now, if that's not scary, because, you know, after a certain age, it's very hard to say who's one or two years younger than the other. But they know, well, Joseph is home at this time already, because at noon he went home. So they are seated one after the other. And to cap it all, Benjamin receives five times more. If you've imagined Benjamin was a little guy, you know, a tiny little silhouette kind of figure, when you see five times as many food in front of him than in front of the other brothers, you kind of have to see a, a big muscle guy. The text doesn't say whether he ate all five portions or not. <laughs> but obviously it was indicated that he was special in the house of Joseph. He was in the end, his little brother. So, they again get grain, they leave, and then out of a blue, somebody running after them, stop, stop, stop! And they are scared again. Why did you take the cup of my Lord? Who took the cup? They are ready to die. They are sure they did not do that. And uh, as you would expect, the cup is found in the sack 
of Benjamin. Now that must have been a very difficult moment. Judah, where are you? Verse 17 and onward says, but he said, far be it from me that I should do so. This is Joseph speaking. The man in whose hand the cup was found, because they all wanted to stay as slaves. He shall be my slave. And as for you, go up in shalom to your father. That's ironic. Go up in shalom, in peace and well-being to your father. But that's a test again. Can these people? Because earlier, they sold their brother into slavery. And with Shalom, they sat down and ate. No problem. Joseph is testing them. Are you going to go back in Shalom? It's very interesting to see this little chiastic structure, the last one here at the bottom, where you have Judah's discourse in front of uh, Jacob, and the focus is on Joseph. So Judah tries to convince Jacob that they have to take Benjamin with them down to Egypt because of what Joseph said. And now Judah has a discourse in front of Joseph with a focus on what? On Jacob. Trying to explain to Joseph, hey, we, we have to take Benjamin with us back home because of what our old father said. Verses, uh, starting with verse 18. Then Judah came near to him and said, O oh my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's hearing, and do not let your anger burn against your servant, for you are even like Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servants, saying, have you a father or a brother? Look at the beauty of Judah's discourse. The elegant way he speaks to Joseph. You asked us, have you a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, we have a father, an old man. And the child of his old age who is young, his brother is dead. And he alone is left of his mother's children, and his father loves him. Isn't that beautiful? Then you said to your servants, bring him down to me that I may set my eyes on him. And we said to my Lord, the lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. That's so touching. He cares about his father. His father would die. And later on it will explain why would he die. But you said to your servants, unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you shall see my face no more. So it was when we went up to your servant my father, to your servant, my father. Was there a dream in which Jacob himself was the servant of Joseph? Look how Judah, not even knowing probably what he's doing, he tells Joseph about Jacob being his servant. 
So it was when we went up to your servant, my father, that we told him the words of my Lord. And our father said, go back and buy us a little food. But we said, we cannot go down if our youngest brother is with us, then we will go down. For we may not see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Then your servant, my father, again, Jacob, being the servant of Joseph, said to us, You know that my wife bore me two sons, and the one went out from me, and I said, Surely he is torn to pieces, and I have not seen him since. But if you take this one also from me, and calamity befalls him, you shall bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. Now, therefore, when I come to your servant, my father, and the lad is not with us, since his life is bound up in the lad's life. Isn't that beautiful? His life is bound up in the lad's life. It will happen when he sees that the lad is not with us, that he will die. So your servant will bring down the gray hair of your servant. Your servants will bring down the gray hair of your servant or father with sorrow to the grave. It's strange that Joseph is not crying yet. He must force himself to, to stay and not reveal the truth yet. For your servant became surety for the lad to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father forever. Now, therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the lad as a slave to my Lord. And let the lad go up with his brothers. For how shall I go up to my father if the lad is not with me, lest perhaps I see the evil that would come upon my father. And this is what is called intercession. When somebody intercedes for somebody else and is ready to take his place. We don't know too much about the character change of all the brothers. Of course, they were all honest people. But even when they tell Joseph about Joseph not being anymore, because that's what they explain to Joseph in their first trip, that they do have a youngest brother but his brother is no more, even then they are lying. Because they were telling the brother that was no more, he was no more. He was there. We don't know what happened with all the brothers like in block. We know a little snippet here and there about Reuben. We know some things about Simeon. But what we see with Judah, to me, is beautiful. The discourse he gives in front of Joseph is a very Christ-like discourse. He speaks about his father, that he cannot go up. The text is very interesting in the Hebrew because it's going down and going up. It's like Jesus says, I can't go up to my father without taking these brothers of mine with me. 
I would rather die here so they can go. The character change of Judah seems to be down the road why Judah is the one that carries on the genealogy, the lineage, going to the Messiah. The story is just amazing. Questions? That's a very good observation. How, how perfidious not telling the truth or lying can become. You can get into a situation where you are telling a lie about somebody in front of that somebody. <laughs> can, you, can you even realize the hilarity of it? So they are telling Joseph about Joseph being no more. Yeah, that's what can happen. Yes. That's a good question. Why didn't Jacob say, hey, I'm going with him? I don't know. I can ask the same question. Why didn't God the Father say, I'm going with Christ, with my son all the way down there? But here's the question. On the cross, when Jesus was pierced, was only Jesus pierced or the Father was pierced too? There's even a Bible verse in the book of uh, Zechariah, if I remember rightly, where the Father says that they pierced me. Because when Jacob allowed Benjamin to go, it was like he was going with him. And he would take the pain. And he speaks to God. Remember that beautiful prayer. Let me see if I can spot it right now. Verse 14 in chapter 43. If I am bereaved, I am bereaved. So in a way, I would say he did go, not physically, obvious. Now, this is an elderly guy. Jacob at this time is an elderly guy. It would be interesting to know whether Isaac is still alive. I suspect not. On the chronology I gave you weeks ago, you may be able to see, I know when Joseph was sold away, Isaac was still alive, according to the biblical data. At this point, I'm not sure, would have to check, but Jacob is not very young already. What we know from the biblical text is that from the time he eventually goes down to Egypt, because that time will come, 17 years pass until he dies. So you have 17 years at the beginning when Joseph, so it's like this, it's a chiasm, 17 years here, Joseph plus Jacob, and then 17 years here, Joseph plus Jacob. We cannot say that jo Jacob could not go down to Egypt because he eventually did go down. But it wasn't the same kind of trip that somebody would do when in need of food, they would get on the donkey and let's go. These are young people, the sons, the brothers. Jacob is an elderly guy. When Jacob is to be brought down to Egypt, the elderly guy, because they, they repeatedly say that our father is old. When he is to come down to Egypt, how does he go down to Egypt? How? Joseph sends carts for him. So he's not riding a donkey. He's put in a somewhat more comfortable vehicle. And that's how he eventually goes down to Egypt. So that may be an explanation why he didn't go physically. He was an elderly guy. It's one thing to have, uh, I don't know, uh, young men in their 30s, 40s. How old was Jacob when he died? 
one, 47, minus 17, not too young, right? So that may be an explanation. <laughs> That's a good observation too, yeah. If they had taken, say, their father with them all the way down to Egypt, you could suspect Jacob knew Joseph much better than his brothers, and uh, the elderly guy may have been able to recognize him. Now, why didn't the brothers recognize Joseph? Well, because of the change of look that he has gone through. He had gone through. Shaved. So there's no Hebrew features that can be easily recognized. Because in those days, as probably today as well, there are some facial features, possibly some uh, uh, attire characteristics that uh, would reveal somebody's identity. And the language as well, because he spoke with a translator. Not that he wouldn't understand, because the text emphasizes several times, even when they were doing this uh, guilt trip kind of conversation, hey, this is happening to us because of this, Joseph can hear them. Oh, that must have been weird. To hear your brothers speak about uh, what they did to you and understand that now they are guilty and this might be happening to them because of that, and uh, you are there, you're listening, you understand, you don't say a word because you're using a translator because you are testing them. Pretty convoluted, right? That's a good observation. It's a lesson for us to get along with our siblings because we never know where our sibling ends up and when we will face our sibling again Maybe even without knowing that after I pass this door, I will be face to face with my sibling. And I could imagine stories in which brothers, sisters, had not spoken to one another for years. And then after years, decades maybe, half a century, they found themselves face to face with that person. That person being in a position of authority, being able to do harm if needed, because they are scared. Even after Jacob passes away, some 17, 18 years later, they are still afraid. They still want to have a conversation with Joseph because they think, hey, now daddy is gone, now the patriarch is out of picture. And now you will see what's going to happen. Yeah, very real things. Absolutely, absolutely. So the whole story, this whole story is a beautiful prefiguration of the salvation story as it is revealed and carried out in Jesus Christ. And I see here a double level of that story. Because up to this point, we are focusing on Joseph being the foreshadow of Jesus. But at, at this point, the Joseph being the foreshadow of Jesus is doubled by what? By Judah. Being the foreshadow of Jesus. Because Judah becomes the same kind of Christ-like figure that brings Jesus' character through this intercession that he does in front of uh, uh, Joseph himself for his little brother, Benjamin. That's a beautiful thing because from that moment, you can extrapolate and say, yeah, so see, there are two possibilities. There's a possibility for somebody to live a seemingly impeccable life, like Joseph. You can't say too much bad about Joseph, unless you suspect him of uh, 
being wrong when he was telling on his brothers, it's, it's hard to find something really bad about him. Or later on when he makes the Egyptians the slaves of Pharaoh, because they have to sell their lands and even themselves into slavery, so to speak. But he doesn't do big moral or immoral things that you would say, yeah, that was bad, Joseph. Shouldn't have done that. Not really. Not so with Judah, though. Judah, he, he's got his uh, share of uh, iniquity, if I may say so. Big share. And yet, and yet, by the grace of God, his life is brought around or turned around. And that's the, the even better way. Yeah, so his, his, his life changes. And this is, this is always a, an important lesson for us in church life. There is, I believe, at least a temptation for those that did not, did not commit big sins to feel like, hey, I've been impeccable for most of my life. Come on. I didn't do things like Judah. And that is always a temptation to feel better, holier, gooder, you know, than the other. When in fact God is working on the change, on uh, the transformation of every single human being's life, regardless of uh, how reprobable your acts of uh, iniquity were in the past. That doesn't mean Joseph should be first like Judah so that they will be now leveled. Because that's another extreme. What does it uh, really matter? Is it worth being like Joseph, like from early youth, and uh, live a beautiful, holy life, different? Because Joseph had the opportunity to become a Judah earlier. You remember the wife of Potiphar? When day by day she was insisting, and he could have given in, he could have uh, caved in and say, yeah, just once. <laughs> Nobody will know. In the end, there is far from here. There's no Seventh-day Adventist around here. <laughs> Nobody will be able to judge me. Is it worth living an impeccable life? Yes, because God can use that impeccable life to change the destiny, not of your family only, but the destiny of the whole empire. I wonder if God would have been able to do the same using Judah with his character at that time. Pretty hard to believe, right? But Joseph was a strong character and God used it. What I'm trying to convey is not that God cannot bring you about and transform, change your life. It is that you may suffer unnecessarily and you may feel that you've lost a good segment of your life, you've wasted it, if you do not make a commitment for God as early as possible. And you will have to learn to live with that kind of experience. And by God's grace, even that is possible. But I believe it's important to see value in walking with the Lord from the beginning to the end. And also see value in God's grace of turning somebody's life around maybe at a later stage in life, because that's grace. That's a beautiful uh, uh, parallelism 
between what happened to Joseph's brothers and what Jesus does for us. Because at one point, Joseph's brothers are brought down to Egypt and they receive uh, the best piece of uh, Egypt, the land of Gosen, a land uh, that was fertile and they could develop their uh, animal husbandry business. They could uh, have uh, sheep, flocks, all kind of uh, animals that they would uh, cattle. And uh, that's one part of the parallelism. The other one is Jesus taking us home and uh, enjoying the best peace of uh, the universe. I don't want to go too far with this, but I just want to give a glimpse of uh, what the Bible says. The Bible says that after the drama of sin is ended here on earth, we are taken out, we are taken to the New Jerusalem, but then the New Jerusalem becomes the capital city of the earth. So then, in a way, I think it's fair to say that planet Earth will become the best piece of the land or of the universe in that bigger picture. So yeah, that's a, that's a beautiful comparison between what Joseph can provide, of course endorsed by the Pharaoh because he was still second in command, and what Jesus can provide. I think I think it is a little challenging to get what Joseph is doing here. So the point is this. These people, these brothers, they already know they are in the wrong by the fact that they sold their brother, they had sold their brother years back, some more than 10 years. So they are already carrying that guilt of not being honest, although they, they keep saying we are honest people, honest people, but they are carrying the guilt of not being honest. They kind of come to the conclusion that all this is happening for them, to them because of that. And now Joseph comes and hits them even harder and puts uh, one more load on it. And he says, you guys are spies. Isn't that too much? Why torture them like that? You would think, right? Is this some sort of a psychology, some sort of a counseling session? Uh, what is this? Some branches of psychology today, all they care about is to somehow explain guilt away. And it's one thing to explain guilt away and act as if nothing happened. And it's something else to deal with it. And that ties into the concept of forgiveness I am going to be preaching about this morning. Forgiveness is not avoiding the problem. Forgiveness is about facing the problem and dealing with it. And one way or another, that's what I see in Joseph's story, he confronts his brothers. How he does it? Yeah, we may have some issues with that. But in the end, the outcome, uh, I don't think, can be challenged, really. Because Joseph really was well-intentioned in his relationship to them. Well, that's it for this morning. Thank you so much. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. This is so beautiful. Yes, indeed, so beautiful to see what happens in the life of some people that can do harm, can do bad things at some points of their lives. But if you take them over, if they allow to be modeled and reshaped by your grace, the change is just outstanding, just amazing. We thank you in Jesus' name, through the Holy Spirit. Amen.